Well, good morning. I'm glad you could join us today at the um, virtual dimension of the teaching ministry here at Living Springs. And uh, we're going to be looking at some passages from Ephesians chapter 5. We're also going to be looking at some important ones from Genesis chapters 2 and 3. So if you have your Bibles, you know, you can mark those places. Um, but uh, let's just get right to it here. Uh, there's no way to beat around the bush about this today. We're going to be dealing with a ridiculously controversial and often divisive topic. And I'm talking about headship. You know, like, well, let's just go right to the, let's get right down to it. Let me share with you a verse from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, to kind of kick this off and get you guys dialed in and hopefully got your attention here. Listen to what it says. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. <laughs> well, everything sounds okay till you hit the thing, you know, the head of woman is man. Um, on Sunday, I couldn't help but notice some of the women, you know, kind of settling down in their seats, rolling their eyes like, oh no, here we go again. And some of the men sitting up in their seats, you know, like eager to hear this particular teaching and hoping that their wives will be submissive to the word of God. Well, you know, we all need to be submissive to the word of God. Let me remind you that right off, okay? So, you know, uh, some of you are probably thinking, you know, like, okay, all right. You think you know what that's about? Well, hold on a minute. Maybe we need to find out really what that is all about. Like I said, it's a verse taken from a passage of scripture that has really long been a source of controversy and disagreement. And it's because it's been misinterpreted and it's grossly misunderstood. But nonetheless, okay, let's start with the basics. Okay, first of all, it does convey a very essential fact, which anyone who's truly reconciled unto God in Jesus Christ and I want to just emphasize that word again, truly reconciled unto God in or through Jesus Christ. This is something, it's, it's a fact that we can neither afford or neglect. We can neither afford to <laughs> neglect or ignore. And I'm talking about the fact that, first of all, what this tells us, it reveals there's a fact that there's a divinely ordained order of life and provision that well, flows from God through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the one whom all of us here, all of us need to focus our faith, our lives, and our hope on so as to realize all the purpose, the blessings, and the provision of God that is supposed to flow down through and to all the rest of us. And it goes back to the beginning, okay? That, well, when God alone created the heavens and the earth, and I'm a firm believer that the Bible means what it says, in six days, according to, well, his eternally predetermined purpose and design, thereby ordering all things accordingly, even as he spoke or said that it should be. Now, the reason I put that in there now, this whole business of order, is so important because... In everything that God does, there is a purpose, there is a design. And a design, by its very nature, entails order. And really, it's, it's revealed to us in his word in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, when you get back to the very beginning. You know, the, the cosmos, or the lights, speaking of the stars, the planets, solar systems, and galaxies, I could go on and on, the earth. Its constitution, as well as all life forms therein, um, so that, first of all, I hope we get it right, you know, where all that stuff came from, actually. And God declared that having done that and created that as he spoke it, he said that it was good. It was right, perfect, nothing lacking, because, well, there was order in all of it, whereby everything existed and functioned, and it's proper relationship to himself and one another in the absolute perfect way God purposed and designed all of it to function in order to 
be and do what God had purposed and designed all of it to be and do. And really, it, it should. It, it bear living testimony to the infinite grace, the knowledge, the glory, his love, his power, and his perfection. And you know the crowning reflection or representation of his person and purpose in all of it? You know what that is? I was telling everybody on Sunday, it's kind of like an artist. He, he knows what, the image of what it is he wants to express on the canvas visually. And as he paints it, in painstaking detail, when he's finished, stands back and looks at it, and if he's like God and says, you know, it's good, it's what I always intended, this is exactly the way it's, it's always been ordained to be, well, you know what? He's going to put his John Henry, his signature, down there on the bottom. So, and the signature testifies to the fact that when you look at this beautiful painting, that conveys exactly what the artist wanted to convey and present. You know, <laughs> you know who painted it. Well, that's kind of what happened with all of the creation. The, the last thing, the crowning representation of his person, as well as his purpose and design and all of it, is like, who did this? Who designed this? Whoa, it's perfect. God created man apart from and above the rest of the earthly creation, created man, it says in the Bible, in his image. In his image so as to live in the midst of all of it and serve, therefore, as a faithful living representation of God, of the, his sovereign lordship over all of it. It's testified to the fact that, well, hey, Although man's physical body, we're told in Genesis chapter 2, was originally created from the dust of the earth, you'd go like, well, what's so, what's so great about that? The body, actually, we assign a lot of value to these bodies, but, you know, that's what it was originally made of. But we're told that God breathed his own spirit into that body, and the Bible says, and man became a living being. And you'll see it for yourself when we get into the second chapter of Genesis today. But, you know, stop and think about that for a moment. Like, a living being. In other words, a person as opposed to merely a thing or a creature. Even as God is a person. A person. And as such... Man was endowed with the capacity to, and therefore the responsibility for making judgments and choices on the basis of what is true versus what is false, what is right versus what is wrong. And you know, God through his word here in fact affords all of us with that absolute light. It's here. No excuses, okay? I mean... It's not really that complicated. In fact, you know, of all else that God created, only the created host of angelic beings possessed that capacity, along with the awesome responsibility that goes along with it, the capacity to make judgments and choices. And you know, the reason that God endowed mankind with that capacity that I should say awesome capacity that sets him apart from all the rest of the creation. Well, there's one simple word for that. The reason is that four letter word, L-O-V-E, love. Because God's sole intent regarding mankind, this is what he wants. He's always wanted it, always will, is that we, may truly know and abide with him in the love that only he could express and demonstrate toward you and I in the eternal perfection of his time and way. And of course, as Christians, you know who we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus. Regarding whom Colossians 1 verses 19 and 20 testifies, where it says, 
For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness, that is, all the fullness of the Godhead should dwell. And by him, Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself by him. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. See, that word reconcile refers to God's eternally foreordained plan to reestablish. That's what reconcile means. To reestablish both a relationship and an order that had previously been broken. That's always been God's purpose and plan for mankind, starting with the very creation, as well as man's fall. As God has always known, he's always known all things past, present, and future. So it wasn't like, well, the fall of man caught him by surprise and like, oh, darn, this, this didn't work the way I planned. I got to do something about it, be done with it all, start all over again, you know, or, or whatever. Or let's get to plan B. No. Look, it's all been unfolding according to his eternally foreordained plan. And that would be that it would be accomplished reconciliation, the reestablishment of a relationship and order that had been previously broken through the miraculous incarnation, the sinless life, selfless suffering, atoning death, and victorious resurrection of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, in our behalf as, well... It is, it's the consummate and forever expression of the love and the life that God has always purposed for us to know and share together with him forever, always and only in Jesus Christ, rather than ourselves or anything else. The point being, in the beginning, as is still the case today, Mankind is presented with the very choice that love demands that each one of us alone has to make in regard to God to either abide in the eternal perfection of his purpose, design, and provision for our lives in the sacred garden of intimate personal relationship with him or to choose to go off our own way in pursuit of our own passions, our own ambitions, our own ways, our own feelings apart from and, and in disregard for him, which is precisely what the first man, Adam and Eve, chose to do in pursuit of the lie that we can be like God. And as such thinking and living like we're the masters of our own lives, our own world and destiny. And as a result, that severed not only a meaningful, eternal, and fulfilling relationship with God, but the eternal perfection of his order for their lives, for our lives, in fact, and the world as well. And, you know, face it, we're all guilty of choosing that same path in life as well. It's that old sinful, selfish nature of the fallen man that God's word often refers to as the flesh. In fact, Many of you might recall from last week that we talked about how the moral and spiritual foundations essential to the peace, order, and stability of human society since the beginning of time, things like God's sovereign purpose and design regarding gender and roles in marriage, family, and society are being systematically torn down and discarded by a seriously militant, self-serving morality these days that is it's born out of the insidious lie that anyone can think and act as their own God and define themselves and their own reality, thereby ordering their own lives and the world and a destiny according to their own feelings, their own desires, their own perceptions, their own wants and ideas instead. And as a result, well, look around us today. It's given rise to all the confusion, the chaos, the lawlessness that has really come to define the current culture and the world that mankind has chosen to make for himself apart from God today. It's what we refer to as 
corruption. <laughs> Quote, unquote, corruption. That's another big word. We just talked about reconciliation. Hey, corruption. Corruption is the breakdown of order, which in the end, well, it causes things to stop functioning the way they're supposed to and eventually die. And you know, you're seeing that happen not only in an increasingly militant and influential cross-section of the population today, but it's threatening literally to bring about the utter collapse of our own culture, society, and nation today. As all you got to do is look back in history. It, it, the same thing's happened repeatedly, starting way back, well, in the very beginning, Genesis. So, I know, it was Father's Day last Sunday, and I knew... Some of the guys started thinking, okay, how does this all tie into Father's Day? Um, well, let's open our text today, beginning in Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to learn the truth about order. Okay? In order for there to be headship, we're talking order, right? Order. 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 All right, listen. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 in your Bible. Let's take a look at it. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Drop down to verse 15. It says, then the Lord God took man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. That place of intimate fellowship with God. Look at verse 18 now. And the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. It's important to realize that word comparable means equal to, okay? In every way like man, it, it, as far as in the sight of God, to be comparable, not, not above or below, neither one of them, but even an equal, okay? Comparable. All right, let's drop down. Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Equal. Okay. So what's the implication here? This is where God establishes one of the bedrock foundations of human society that's, that, that guarantees stability, peace, and, and function in our societies because it goes on. This is what God says. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Not like this, not like this, one flesh. So there you have it, the relationship. Woman was taken from man, wherefore being of the man is comparable to man, in other words, equal with man, so that in marriage the two are one and the same in the sight of God, essentially two distinct persons having and functioning in perfect unity and oneness. I mean, what a wonderful, in fact, perfect design for human relationship. And it, it begins with marriage and family, serving as the bedrock foundation for social peace and stability for cultures all over the world for thousands of years since the beginning. And it's a design that entails order, thereby enabling the two to function as God always intended, perfectly together as one. I mean, face it, man and woman, husband and wife, both can't function in the same role. Otherwise, neither completes the other or complements the other in the way that God always determined. Rather, as each functions in their own respective role, that's what they do. They com complement and complete. So as to realize of God's grace, love, and provision in the blessed relationship in life that they were created and endowed to share together as a result. It's, 
Well, it's the same with the church. The church, we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, being one body consisting of many members, each member having his or her own respective role. That's what this is about, all of us. Okay? That God appoints to each of us and then endows and gifts us so as to function for the good of the whole. And not, you know, not everybody can do all the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 17 and 18 explains this principle, and the same thing applies to marriage. It says, if the whole body were an eye, well, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now it says, God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he has pleased. And the same is in marriage and family as far as the roles are concerned, the roles and responsibilities that, are, that God has appointed to, to, to the gender of male and female, husband and wife, parents and children, right on down. And then it also then, then flows out among all of us together as his people in the church, the body of Christ. See, the point being is this, okay? I said it before, I'll say it again. Design entails order. As has always been the case when it comes to God's design for our lives and relationships. You may have design, but if there's no order to it, it's not design, it's chaos. It's confusion. We're seeing that in our culture in America today. And the order of God's design for our lives and relationships we saw it, it does, it begins with marriage and family, as well as fellowship with one another in the body of Christ. Now, I want you to watch what happens now when that order was broken. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. We read, it says, and the Lord God commanded the man. Okay, this is your role, man or Adam. Okay. This was before the woman was even created. The Lord God commanded the man saying, Now of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge and the good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now if man regards the order, God's order, as coming from God himself, well man's going to listen to that. Man's going to receive it, and, and man will, will act on that accordingly because he regards the order. He understands his place in relationship to God. Okay? Now, when you break that order, guess what? You're talking about corruption, and corruption will invariably ensue. Okay? So notice the order. Again, God commands the man, making man accountable to God, the intent being that he can therefore now live and function in the blessing of God's gracious design and provision as long as he regards that order, respects it, and receives God's word as God's word. And that's all it required for, of man just to simply honor God's eternally ordained order for the life God had wanted man to share with and to realize in himself. But there's always a choice now, okay? Man has a capacity. And, and we know, unfortunately, however, after the woman had been taken from the man and given to him as a helpmate, totally comparable or equal to man, man chose to break from God's ordained order and instead see himself as... Uh, I'm the sovereign Lord and master of my own life, my own world and destiny, so yeah, I can choose to do what I want. I can, I can judge on the basis of my perception, my wants, my ambitions, my feelings, and, and a host of other things that tend to influence our decisions in life. Check it out. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 3. We're going to read the whole chapter here, okay? We read, now the serpent, this is the very embodiment of, of, of the devil himself, 
presented in the form of a serpent, a creature that Adam and Eve were familiar with apparently, and he didn't look like what he is today. It must have been something that they, you know, they were impressed with and like, hey, you're like having this guy around, he's okay, you know, maybe a great pet or something. I don't know, but we're told now the serpent, there's something about him that they didn't realize he's more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and he could talk. No wonder they like him. <laughs> and he said to the woman, now this is the devil speaking through this guy, okay, this creature. Has God indeed said? He's questioning the word of God. We see that in our culture today, everywhere you go in our and our media and our culture and the education establishment is all about questioning, first of all, what the Word of God says. It's like, come on, you guys really believe that stuff? <laughs> You're not very enlightened, man. Go educate yourself. So here you have it. This is where it came from. He says to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Hmm, never really thought about it. Really? That's an interesting question. But sows doubt. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, God has said. And she learned this from the man. The man told her. God said, hey, this is the only thing we got we, we to gotta watch out for and, you know, order our thoughts according to this word that God has given us for our own benefit for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Actually, uh, I got to back up just a minute. That was actually not what the woman said. The woman's response to the man, she said, we may, I mean, her response to the serpent was, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, God, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. It's a consequence. That's part of accountability, okay? Okay? So, the serpent says to the woman, come on, you will not surely die. Now, you got to remember that mankind up to the, at that point had never experienced death. It, it wasn't a reality that existed. So, the whole idea of dying in the first place... This is where you got to really take God at his word, okay? They didn't know what it meant. <laughs> so uh, here the serpent says, well, you will not surely die. For God knows in the day of you eat it, you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, it's important to remember, uh, God knows all things. But at that time, mankind only knew the good. He only knew the good of God's gracious provision, the perfection of all of it, that he was enjoying in the midst of which he was living in fellowship with God. So the whole idea of evil, you know, good and evil, well, what, what in the world is that? So the woman, she looks at the tree, and now she's relying on her own perceptions. And she's going to make her own judgments. She saw, she looked at the tree, saw it was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise. Wise, hey? Wow, like God. And she took of its fruit and she ate. And listen to this, man. She gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew then they were naked Suddenly they see their whole world in a whole different light. They're frightened. They're ashamed. It's like, whoa, we're not so hot after all. Yeah, actually. <laughs> they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So now they're scared of God. They're running from God. Why? Because Adam disregarded the order. He should have stopped his wife 
and say, hey, no, 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 no. Don't do it. We're not going to do that. But he didn't. We saw that he capitulated, he compromised, whatever you want to call it. But he went along with something that God had clearly said, uh, hey, look, you do that, man. It's, corruption is going to set in that eventually leads to death. It's just what's going to happen. Of course, they thought they were smarter than God, wiser than God, or at least wise as God so that, yeah, who, oh, come on, God, I can do what I want. So anyway, you know, right on the line, says God called to Adam and said, you know, where are you? Come on, I'm calling you out, basically. And so Adam says, well, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God's like, oh, all right, who, who told you were naked? Who, who, have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? It wasn't like God didn't know, but he's like, He's nailing man goes right to the point that you just did what you weren't supposed to do. It's one of those questions that actually answers itself. And the man now, she said, well, hey, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree and I ate. So he's trying to pass the buck. And this is the thing now. You're blaming other people because you're so wise and everything. Oh, come on, man. No, it's not my fault. It's their fault. I'm the victim. Hear that all the time today, too. Lack of personal responsibility. <laughs> and the Lord said to the woman, well, what is this you've done? The woman, now she does the same thing. She says, the servant deceived me and I ate. And I've heard that a lot of times. Yeah, the, the devil made me do it. <laughs> the Lord God said to the servant, because you've done this, you're cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field, and on your belly. You will go and you'll eat of the dust all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between your, you and the woman's seed and, and your seed and he shall bruise your head, literally crush it, and you'll bruise his heel. It's a messianic prophecy concerning the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on our behalf on the cross. Anyway, but to the woman he said, now I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and in pain you will bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to the man, he said, cursed is the ground for your sake. Okay, you don't need me anymore. You can do this by yourself. You think you're like me? Okay, go for it. This is what you wanted. This is a choice you made. You're on your own, okay? In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the, in the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground. Corruption is set in, man. The whole order now has been broken. And now the reason? He says, for out of it you were taken, your body. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Man, now it's just... Him, it's, his, it's, it's our bodies. Our bodies are everything. Oh, they're great when we're young and we're vibrant, we're attractive and we're talented and we're like strong and everything. But hey, I'm finding this out. You get older. You get older and things don't work so well. You don't look so good. It's, so, it's like until finally you get to the place where like, man, I, I, I'm tired of living in this thing. Anyway, so... That's the way it is when corruption sets in. So uh, this is all what happened. And, um, and you notice how Adam, the husband, rather than faithfully and selflessly upholding the word that God has specifically given to him for the good of both he and his wife and their posterity, yeah, the rest of us, he abdicates his appointed role and responsibility in the order that God had ordained to care and to provide for the good of his wife and family by first and above all else faithfully administering and upholding the truth and light that God had provided both of them through him. Choosing instead to receive from his wife 
something she had received from a source other than God through her husband. So I, you know, I'm like, better be careful where you're getting your knowledge and your wisdom. What's the source? It was something sinister, a lie, a lie that appealed to their own senses and desires instead, rather than their regard for God's established order. The point being, as I said, had Adam faithfully submitted himself to God's ordained order, none of the confusion, the chaos, and darkness, the suffering, and, and the lawlessness, for that matter, that is so thoroughly corrupted, bringing such suffering, lawlessness, and death upon the whole of the human race throughout history would have ever come upon his wife and posterity. Rather, they would have continued to abide in the fullness and perfection of the life God had always intended for all of us to know and realize in himself. But unfortunately, we all know what happened instead. Adam, along with his wife, chose to bow instead to that lie that they could be like God. Thinking and acting as the sovereign lords and masters of their own lives, their world, and destiny. And as a result, breaking the order God had ordained for our lives and world, whereby, yeah, corruption immediately ensued, bringing misery, brokenness, and eventually death to every facet of the creation, beginning, beginning with, get this, their own marriage relationship. You remember back in verse 16, what, what did God tell Eve, the wife? He told her, said, your desire shall be for your husband. In other words, you're going to want to take the role of your husband. You're going to want to take charge. I mean, your husband has disregarded the order of God and already screwed up big time. And guys, we all have. And so she's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to run the show here. I'm going to rise up and call the shots here. And the man, look at his response. God warns her, he says, and he shall rule over you. Talking about marital discord. The battle of the sexes. Yeah, the woman decides she's going to assume the man's role for herself, where in turn the husband fights to assert his own sense of dominance over women. It's a vicious cycle of contention and strife. We're seeing played out in our world, and our culture, marriages and families, and yeah, I see it even in many churches, giving rise to much of the confusion, the chaos and militancy involving gender, roles, and responsibility, that even now is threatening to tear apart and bring down our very culture and society today. It's corruption, pure and simple, a total breakdown of the order that God has always ordained, beginning with gender, marriage, children, and families, and it's all born purely out of selfishness. Selfishness. That's what it is. Putting ourselves above everyone else, including God. The simple message being, okay, if we, talking to the church, I'm talking to Christians, if we as those who've been reconciled unto God in Jesus Christ are going to realize the perfection of God's order reestablished in our own lives, marriages, families, and fellowship, Men, hey guys, especially husbands and fathers are going to have to reject and stand up to the lies, beliefs, and practices that culture is falling prey to these days regarding gender roles, marriage, and families today, choosing instead to assume our God-given role and responsibility is the head in our marriages, families, and the church. And here's the catch. Here's the caveat. Even as Christ is head of all of us, 
even as Christ? What's that all about? That is the standard of what true headship in God's economy and kingdom is all about. And, and first off, let, just let me say, I mean, now you know, we're not talking about dominating and ruling over anybody, especially our wives and women in general, or, or one another in the body of Christ, because you've seen it now, you saw it. That's what happens where God's order has been broken in our lives and relationships, and instead we make everything always and only about ourselves and our position and our authority. <laughs> no, no. Being the head means something entirely different and better for all of us. For example, look at Ephesians 5 in your Bibles. Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 25. This is it, man. Here comes the headship, the definition of what it actually is, what God means when he speaks of it in his word. We're told here, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So who does the woman have her eyes on? Not her husband. It sounds like he's not the boss of me. I'm not doing this for him. It says, it's to the Lord. Her eyes are on the Lord. For according to the Lord, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ. Now here it goes, as also Christ is head of the church. What are we talking about? Jesus uh, says, and he is the savior of the body. He is the source of our salvation. He's the source of all of the goodness, the grace, and the blessings of God. He's the source of the eternal life, the forgiveness, the mercy. I could go on and on. He is the source of it. It flows from God through him to all of us, the body. So therefore, it says, just as the church is subject to Christ, that all of us, as the body of Christ, are looking to him alone, it says, so let wives be to their own husbands and everything. Okay, husbands, men, and this is what it means for you. Here's what you are responsible for as the head. Husbands, listen to this, love. It doesn't say rule, it doesn't say dominate, it doesn't say boss around, it doesn't mean threaten or intimidate or manipulate or lie to them. It says, husbands, love your wives. How are you going to do that? What's the standard? Again, who are we looking to? We're looking to Jesus. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. And how did he love us? It says, and gave himself for her. Gave. He didn't take. He gave himself. He didn't take from her. He didn't take from any of us. And men, we're not to take from women. Women are not sex objects. They're not given to make us feel good. They're not given to obey everything. And, and when we say jump, they're like, how high? They're not supposed to make us feel important, satisfy us. We're not supposed to take from them. We're supposed to give to them. That's what headship is about. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. See, so notice that the husband's appointed headship in the marriage and family order essentially entails once again faithfully and selflessly representing the headship of God in Christ. 
And he does this, the man does this by simply giving of himself to love, to honor, and care for his wife, even as Christ loved the church, as evidenced by the fact that he gave himself for us. And we all know how that was done. It was done totally unconditionally and selflessly. That is how, as real men, husbands and fathers, live and function in the order God has always ordained for our lives, our family, and fellowship in Christ. Which in turn now is how wives, children, and others, in fact, come to benefit from the goodness, the blessings, and grace that God's design and order provides for their lives. As men selflessly give of themselves so as to facilitate rather than hinder. I'm going to say that again. To facilitate rather than hinder the flow of God's grace and goodness and his blessings to others, beginning with our families, our marriages and our families. That is what being a husband and father is all about. Not being a tyrant or a ruler, but a loving, faithful servant who's accountable to God. That's God's design. That's his order. That's what God is, 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 is telling women they're to submit to. And who wouldn't submit to that? That's why I submit to Jesus. That's the way he treats me. That's because of what he did for me. That's because of his love that was demonstrated for me. Well, the same should be with men in regards to women, their wives, their families, and all of us together as the body of Christ. And it only works. You, you, look, there's no other way. You can't do this any other way. It only works as together we look to Jesus. Don't look at me. Don't look at others. Don't look at somebody else. Don't look at yourself. You are not the standard of headship. Jesus is our example. Look to Jesus alone as the head of everyone and the source of everything that God graciously provides for the realization of his purpose and design for all of our lives. So that we are and do then what each of us have been called to be and do. And doing it with all our heart is unto the Lord and not for the purpose of pleasing ourselves or anyone else. That is what true biblical headship that faithfully represents the sovereign lordship and the love of God in Christ in and through our lives, marriages, families, and fellowship is all about. It's not about tyranny. It's not about lordship. Because it's not about us. It's about humble, loving, and selfless submission to the lordship of God in Jesus Christ. Demonstrated by the giving of ourselves to serve the good of others. A point which Paul himself made when he referred Timothy, for instance, as a true and genuine pastor. Not some wannabe. He told the churches in Philippi, he wrote to them in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. So now I just wanted to end by touching on headship in the church. He tells them, he says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. They needed a pastor, okay? And he's recommending Timothy to him, he's sending them to him. And here's what he says. He doesn't refer to a resume. He doesn't refer to any degrees or anything from a seminary. None of that stuff. Not how amazing this guy is, how eloquent he is, how talented he is, how impressive he is, how imposing he is, how charismatic he is, or how any of that stuff. He recommends Timothy to them as a pastor, an elder, an overseer, one who loves, who serves, and genuinely cares for the church. He says, for I have no one else like-minded 
who will sincerely care for your state, for all, and he's looking at pretty much everybody else that's into doing this stuff. He says, for, for all seek their own. They're just saying it for themselves. The notoriety, the fame, the reputation, the, the recognition, the praise, the whatever. He says, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. Of Christ Jesus being lived out in and through my own life. But he tells them, he says, but you know his proven character. In other words, they've seen Timothy. They know what a servant he is. And Paul says as such. He says that as a son with his father, so there's this mentorship, there's this humility in serving. He says as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. So, church, look, let's honor God's ordained order for our lives, beginning with our marriages, our families, and fellowship, okay? And that entails men, men assuming their place in that order and the respective role. So I'm going to say this, men, it's time to get right with God and assume our calling in place in God's order by stepping up to be the kind of head that facilitates rather than hinders the grace and the blessing of God's purpose, design, and provision to those We've been called to love and to serve. Not seeking to dominate and rule over anyone. So as to indulge for our own benefit what we can gain for ourselves from others. Rather, let's, <clears throat> as men, give of ourselves to serve others. Out of that which God has committed to us for their blessing and benefit. Beginning with our wives, our children, and then the fellowship that we share with one another in Jesus Christ.